This is the motto of the show, Hour of the Truth. Rome never changes. They used to call us heretics and sent the Inquisition to kill us. Today they call us terrorists and send on their crusades. Times and methods may have changed, but gold still stays the same. Extirpate the remnant of the true word of God, Bible believing people who will hold the truth in Jesus Christ's name. Suffering at the hands of Rome Cause they believed in Christ alone They died through Europe, especially Spain For they saw all but Christ is vain He suffered by His death for men To save them from their awful sin Six hundred years of martyred saints that history cannot erase With iron heel and iron hand The Roman Pope rule the land Those ignorant of history May be swept into apostasy We won't be loved by Rome's sweet lie with 50 million reasons why Salvation is by faith alone In Christ alone, by grace alone A sovereign God give faith to man Salvation's in the Maker's hand This gospel offends Rome today They offer up Another way, a counterfeit, a compromise Beware the ancient papal lie With such a cloud of witnesses Who by grace died in their Lord Recall their memory to say By the same faith we live today Hello and welcome everybody to another Hour of the Truth, again in collaboration this time with Tom Fress from Inquisition Update, who will be my co-host and my very, very valued guest in the 18th study of, to, to prove to you, <laughs> of proving, that was what I wanted to say, of proving that the New Testament is irrefutable proof itself of Jesus Christ being the fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy in Daniel chapter 9, especially verses 24 through 27. That Jesus Christ was and still is the fulfillment of Daniel's 70th week. There is no future 70th week. Therefore, there is no future Antichrist. There is no future tribulation. There is no future rapture. We went through all this stuff in the reading with Steve Wahlberg's book, End Time Delusions. Here we are really concentrating on the Bible. The 1611, uh, author, uh, the authorized version of 1611 King James Bible is our, uh, our, our meat stuff. How do you say that? Our, um, uh, our rule for, for our morals and our reading and um, what, what uh, for, for the truth. Yeah, that is the basis of the truth that we are teaching. It has to be measured at the Bible. We will show to you irrefutable proof that the New Testament is the proof that Jesus Christ was the fulfillment. And this is the 18th reading already, and yeah, okay, I'm going to warmly welcome Tom Fress to the broadcast now, because I'm stumbling about my own words here, I don't know why. <laughs> Hello, Tom, welcome. Hello, Yerk, uh, it's nice to be here. I'll just finish what you were trying to say. Uh, the New Testament is the literal historical record of the 70th week of Daniel. A seven-year period of time, beginning with Christ's anointing in the River Jordan by John the Baptist. Three and a half years later, his crucifixion, where he confirms the covenant in his blood, and he causes all sacrifices and oblations to cease. And then three and a half years later, being the end of the 70th and final week of Daniel, 
Jerusalem is given one more opportunity to receive Christ as their lamb by the witness of Stephen. And Stephen witnessed to the Sanhedrin of the, the Messiah Jesus, Messiah the Prince, the Prince that shall come, according to Daniel's prophecy, that he was the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world, the promised Messiah that all of the law and the prophets foresaw. He was the fulfillment of the 70th and final week of the prophet Daniel's 70-week prophecy. And the Sanhedrin rejected Jesus, as we well know, and stoned Stephen to shut him up. From that time, the end of the 70th week, the 70th week of Daniel is over. Israel rejected the Messiah, and because of that, God sent the gospel to the Gentiles. During the 70th week of Daniel, Jesus said, Go not, un uh, go not unto the way of the Gentiles, because the 70th week of Daniel was not yet over. But as soon as the 70th week of Daniel was over, the gospel went to the Gentiles. As, as Yerk so uh, adroitly pointed out some time ago, ask yourself, who is responsible for spreading the gospel in the world today? Is it Jews or is it Gentiles? Well, the answer is obvious. It's Gentiles. There's your proof that the 70th week of Daniel is over. Okay? Now, if the 70th week of Daniel is over, and we have the perfect and complete historical record of that 70th and final week, what should we do with all the pastors who preach a future 70th week? One that is not, does not even begin until 2,000 years later. As if God completely, prophetically skipped over the entire church age and is going to fulfill Daniel's 70th week in the last seven years of time before Jesus Christ returns. You've got to admit to yourself there's something really fishy about this. At the very least, you must admit there is something really, really fishy about this, and you have to get to the bottom of it. That's what we're here to do. We're here to help you get to the bottom of it. And the bottom line is, the 70th week of Daniel is over. They sealed up the vision and the prophecy of Daniel 2,000 years ago. No one has any authority to open the seals of that prophetic scroll and offer a, an alternative fulfillment 2,000 years after the fact. When God says to seal up the vision and the prophecy, that's just exactly what he means. And every Protestant and evangelical pastor that you know of in your life, no matter if it's in the United States or Europe or anywhere else around the world, every Protestant and evangelical pastor, with only rare exceptions, have felt free to peel the seals off of that prophecy and that vision and offer you, sitting in the pew, an opportunity to rewrite that prophecy and that vision a prophecy and a vision that only God has the right to manipulate. The 70th week of Daniel is over. There's no question about it. The New Testament perfectly attests in copious detail using the very same words that Daniel used in his prophecy 
to assure each and every one of us that the 70th week of Daniel is over. If the 70th week of Daniel is not over, then Jesus was not the fulfillment of it. That means Jesus was not the promised Messiah. That means Messiah, Jesus, did not come in the flesh. If there was a man named Jesus that came in the flesh but who did not fulfill the 70th week of Daniel, then he was a false Messiah, wasn't he? A false Jesus, wasn't he? You see where this is going? And the Jesuits and all the Protestant and evangelical pastors and teachers in the world today are telling us that there's a future fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel. What do you suppose the purpose of a future fulfillment is? It must be to declare that Jesus was a false Messiah and the real Messiah comes at the end of time. And you can bet it's going to follow the futurist delusion that we've been talking about for so many months. To present to the world, first of all, a false antichrist. Anyone at all who can sign a seven-year peace treaty with the Jews to allow them to build a temple and begin animal sacrifices again, and then three and a half years later, renege on that agreement, that so-called covenant, and cause the sacrifices and oblations to cease. Okay? It was Jesus, don't forget, who caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease when he himself became the sacrifice 2,000 years earlier. The real Messiah, the real prince that shall come, did exactly what Daniel prophesied. He confirmed a covenant in his blood for, for three and a half years. And in the midst of the week, he caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease. But the futurists want the Antichrist to confirm a covenant with the Jews. And then after three and a half years, break the covenant, which you would expect an Antichrist to do, wouldn't you? So then the whole deceived Protestant and evangelical world will be utterly and irretrievably convinced that that person is the Antichrist. They've been waiting for him for 2,000 years. They've been praying against him for 2,000 years. But he's going to come, according to their false prophecy of Daniel's 70th week, going to sign a peace treaty with the Jews, going to renege on the treaty for th after three and a half years, and whatever happens to him from that point on is irrelevant. What is most important to uh, these deceived uh, uh, Christians is that three and a half years later, Jesus is going to come. And there's going to be three and a half years, at the very least, if not seven years, of great tribulation. Okay? And you want to make sure that you don't have to go through this great tribulation by doing something or other to warrant being raptured out just in the nick of time so you don't have to suffer that kind of persecution and hell on earth. Which, which really makes more sense to you according to the scriptures? Well, according to the scriptures, Tom, I think it is relevant for once and for all to lay the ground stone to tell the people, when you follow the Bible, in Daniel chapter 9, Jesus is announced first, and then Jesus, during his ministry, warns of the coming Antichrist. He sure does. In, so the does future, in the future is telling, yeah, I'm just talking about Jesus now. But the whole New Testament, of course, afterwards is proof of the uh, of the warning of the coming Antichrist in Paul's words, in John's words, okay? But that's when you follow the Bible. When you follow the futurist teaching, first Antichrist comes, and then Jesus Christ comes. It's 180 degrees around. And that's always that's what the devil does. He turns everything 180 degrees around. He puts it in a mirror, so to speak. The Bible says, first Christ, then Antichrist. And futurism says, no, 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 first Antichrist, and then Christ. And that's all it would take if people really cared about the truth. 
That is all it would take for God's people to simply at that point get up out of the pews and walk out the door. When the preacher tells you that first Antichrist comes and then Jesus Christ comes, he has proven to you beyond any denial that he is deceived and he is deceiving you. In the scripture, Antichrist must be revealed before Christ comes. Okay? Jesus didn't leave us ignorant of who the Antichrist would be. Why would he leave his people ignorant of the truth? After he had bled and died for them, would he then jeopardize their souls by leaving them in doubt about who the Antichrist would be? You know, there were those who were saying that, that Christ had already uh, re returned. And Paul chastised them. Don't you listen to them. Christ cannot come before the man of sin is revealed. Okay? The Antichrist comes first. Isn't that the way it happened, Yerk? Absolutely, Tom. Yeah, In and there history, are many there are many people who speak about uh, that Jesus Christ was uh, already coming back after 70 A.D. and all that stuff. It's just pure pure preterism where these people are caught, and uh, it's 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 a shame to see people being caught in these lies, whether preterism or futurism, but just that they have no idea that they should stick to the Bible. What we call historicism is just the biblical fulfillment of prophecies, which are nothing else but history written in advance. So it's the biblical explanation. Whether you call it historicism or whatever name you want to call it, it is the biblical explanation that counts. Preterism is anti-biblical. Futurism is anti-biblical. Stick to the Bible and what the Bible tells you. And if the Bible doesn't tell you that the Bible is the complete fulfillment, the biblical history and prophecies are the fulfillment, what we call historicism. When the Bible doesn't tell you that, when the Holy Spirit doesn't lead you into that truth, then you are not following the Holy Spirit. That's why in the New Testament it said that we should test all spirits and reprove them and see whether they are from God. Right, Tom? Yep. But people don't test the spirits anymore. They follow any spirit that takes their hand. Yeah. Oh, it's so nice here in sugar-coated USA land, you know? Wonderfully. We're all flying on pink unicorns in the sky, eating candy all the time. It's a wonderful life. Hallelujah. That spirit is not the spirit of truth, let me tell you that. The fact of the matter is... When Paul was witnessing to the Thessalonian Christians, the first century, during the life and times of the Apostle Paul, he warned the Thessalonians that uh, Christ cannot come until that man of sin be revealed. And yet there was something restraining the rise of, that, of the Antichrist. There was a let or a restrainer a hinderer that was preventing the immediate rise of the Antichrist, whom they were expecting immediately. And, of course, when Paul was face to face with the Thessalonians, when he was there in Thessalonica and could meet with the Thessalonian Christians face to face, he spoke candidly with them, carefully in private so that His voice wasn't overheard outside the, 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 uh, the, wherever it was that they were meeting because he certainly wouldn't want this information to become public because the Thessalonian church would have been persecuted. Paul would have been pursued and killed for or assassinated for treason or 
inciting uh, an insurrection of the Roman government. Well, what he told the Thessalonians was that what was preventing the rise of this, this prophesied man of sin, this, this wickedness called the Antichrist or the little horn or the beast in the scripture, was none other than the Roman Empire, the Roman emperors, the established pagan Roman governorship, which even crucified Christ. Okay? They were ruthless and bloodthirsty, and they were going to defend their Roman Empire come hell or high water. And if there was anybody in the realm, especially from these radical Christians that had such a reputation for disturbing the peace, came out and publicly announced that the Roman Caesars were going to be taken out of the way, they would have sent legions of Roman armies to put down the insurrection before it got started. So Paul spoke clandestinely to the people face to face, and he told them, when the Roman Empire uh, is taken out of the way, when the Caesars are taken out of the way, then the Roman Empire is going to disintegrate into ten kingdoms, okay? And then out of those ten kingdoms, another little kingdom would arise, and eventually it would control the whole Roman Empire, okay? It's then that that wicked will be revealed. And we know this is what happened because history records it perfectly and completely. You know, as for the 70th week of Daniel, we don't have to look to secular history to prove its fulfillment. It's recorded for us right in the Bible, infallibly, right there in the New Testament, okay? We don't have to doubt the secular historical account of the fulfillment of the 70th and final week of Daniel's prophecy. We've got it right there in the Bible. Nobody can challenge us on the facts. It's all in black and white, right in the new. It's like a diary of the 70th and final week of Daniel's prophecy. If you want to see anywhere in the in a historical record the complete and perfect fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy of the 70th week, you look nowhere but the New Testament. Okay, there you'll find all your questions answered, as we have already demonstrated. But for the rise of the Antichrist, we have to depend upon secular history. And you know something about secular or worldly history? None of the historians question or doubt how this man of sin was revealed. It was only after the established Roman authority was taken out of the way. When the Caesars were taken out of the way, what replaced the power vacuum in Rome, left behind by the Caesars, what rose in that power vacuum was none other, none other, listen to me carefully, none other than what we know today as the papacy. Okay? No question. There's no quarrel. There's no argument. Nobody proposes an alternative view of history. It's well established. It's inarguable. Nobody challenges the fact because the evidence is overwhelming. It's irrefutable. It's a sure thing. And so you'll find no one else challenging who it was that replaced the Caesars of the old Roman Empire. And Everyone can, knows and agrees that it was the papacy. And we can make that solid with dates, Tom. That's right. Everybody knows that it's the year 476 when the Gas means the wild tribes of the north, let's say, invaded Rome and bring pagan Rome into a fall. Pagan Rome then morphed into papal Rome. And that started in 538 when the uh, the Bishop of Rome was given um, temporal power over Western Europe by the Justinian decree, Emperor Just, uh, Justinian. And in 606 AD, by Emperor Phocas, that was even more severe than the papacy or the, 
the Bishop of Rome was given the spiritual power of the Eastern and the Western churches of the Roman Empire. So he had temporal power from fi uh, temporal power from 538. He had ecclesiastical or spiritual power from 606, and that means that the little horn became that big as you can see it here in the picture. And from that moment on, the papacy established its reign until the year 1075, and by Hildebrand, Gregory the Seventh, actually a theocracy, a kingdom of God on earth was declared with the uh, quarrel the Pope had with uh, the German uh, emperor about the, um, uh, the uh, about naming the bishops and the German emperor had to crawl to Canossa to the feet of the Pope and kiss his feet that was Gregory the Seventh, Hildebrand, and that was the establishment of the theocracy here on earth, when the Pope ruled absolutely supreme, followed the by... Listeners might, fo the yeah, listeners fo might need a little help here, and I, I'm willing to help them with this, because the, most of the listeners who are futurists have never heard of this before, but these are the real facts of history. Yerk has already mentioned the power accrued to the papacy as king of kings, where he gained his kingly authority and asserted himself as king of kings, okay? Then there was a time later when the papacy was given spiritual power. In other words, he was called the bishop of Rome, but the, from that point on, he became known as the bishop of bishops and head of all the holy churches, unquote. That was an official decree by the emperor okay so now all of a sudden the pope is not only king of kings by 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 kingly decree but he was also lord of lords by kingly decree the old emperorship had invested both temporal and spiritual power in the pope and that's when the bishop of rome became the pope of Rome, or the Antichrist of Scripture, history, and prophecy. Now, you have to remember that Daniel, or rather, rather Paul, convinced the Thessalonians that there was a power that was going to replace the Caesars at some time in the in the in the near future, and that he would rise to power after this uh, Roman power was taken out of the way, and. We also know that all the churches in every city where Christendom existed, all those churches independently picked their own bishops. Someone well studied in the scriptures, one of the elders who might rightly have white hair on his head and a white beard on his face, an old man. Someone well studied in the scriptures, one known to have lived a holy Christian life, was made a bishop in that church. And so every church all over Christendom had its own bishop. And everybody knew that it was the Spirit's job to pick the bishop. Okay? Or the, if the, the, the churches themselves appointed their bishop. They selected out of all the elders in the church one most worthy for the position. And that position was not a position of authority over the church, but he was a, declared a most worthy servant of the church. Everything he thought, did, and said was directed towards serving the congregation solving disputes, helping people understand the scriptures, being an intercessor and a mediator, and, and serving the church, not lording it over the church, but a servant. Now, there came a day that we've already discovered, we've already talked about, where the Bishop of Rome was called Bishop of Bishops, Universal Bishop and head of all the holy churches. And when that decree went out from the Roman uh, powers, 
all of a sudden, all the little churches in Christendom who had their own independently appointed bishops were told, from now on, only the Bishop of Rome can pick the bishop for your church. And you just have to know that all over Christendom, when the command came came forward that the Bishop of Rome was going to pick your bishop for you, God was not going to be involved. It was going to be a bishop of Rome, a stranger, somebody who lived hundreds and hundreds of miles away with his authority was going to pick the bishop for your church. Guess what the Thessalonians and every other Protestant preacher and pastor and parishioner all over the Christendom said, this must be the Antichrist. To think that he can, from his distant perch, appoint bishops over us? If there's anyone left in doubt in Christendom who this power is that replaces the Caesars and thinks to change God's times and laws and lords it over God's heritage, let them no longer doubt. Now that the restrainer is out of the way, the man of sin has clearly been revealed. It is the Bishop of Rome. The man of sin, the forbidden antichrist who will persecute the saints of the Most High, think to change times and laws. And he, listen, he has fulfilled every other prophecy in the Bible about the antichrist, the beast. And th- listen, up until about 1800, there was no question in any Bible believer's mind who the Antichrist was. They knew it was the Pope just as well as they knew that Jesus was the Christ. They knew that the papacy is the Antichrist. No one was ignorant of this. No Bible-believing Christian of any generation from the first century church in Thessalonica up until about 1800 A.D., not any Bible-believing Christian, no matter where he lived in Europe or in Asia, doubted one whit who the Antichrist was. They knew who he was, just as we know Jesus is the Christ. They knew the papacy is the Antichrist. And they preached against him. Morning, noon, and and night, they warned all the believers everywhere, the bishop of Rome has become that man of sin, the son of perdition, the one who thinks he is Christ on earth. And people went to the torture. They went to the stake. They went to the racks. They went to the auto de fe. They were eaten by dogs. They were tormented, tortured, abused, falsely accused, imprisoned. Their goods were were confiscated. They were left penniless and without support, even from their own families. Their blood was spilled all over the world, everywhere that true Bible-believing Christians were who said, Jesus is the Christ, the papacy is the Antichrist. They were slain without restraint, and anyone who killed them thought themselves doing God's business. Prophecy fulfilled. Who would think that the papacy is not the Antichrist? The answer, no one. As a matter of fact, the truth all of a sudden became so obvious that the papacy is the Antichrist, that during the time of the Protestant Reformation, Roman Catholics were leaving the Roman Catholic Church in droves. They realized that they were worshiping, serving, and obeying the man of sin in Rome. And they flooded out of the Roman Catholic Church with such volume that the papacy thought the church was going to be destroyed. There wouldn't be anybody left to worship him. 
and the kings of the earth who served the papacy and who did the Pope's bidding and launched armies and crusades and inquisitions to kill every man, woman, and child who said, Jesus is the Christ, the papacy is the Antichrist, all of a sudden would not any longer take orders from the man of sin in Rome because they realized they were making war against the Lamb of God, their Savior, their Messiah, the one who bled and died for them. They were worshiping and obeying the very Antichrist of Scripture, history, and prophecy. There was no ignorance in the true church of Jesus Christ. There never was a doubt. It's only in our generation. A generation of Christians who think they are the most blessed, the most caring Christians, the most loving and adoring Christians, the most Christ-loving and adoring Christians there ever was in a quote-unquote Christian nation, the greatest quote-unquote Christian nation that ever was in the history of the world. And you ask them who the Antichrist is? Some of them will tell you we're not supposed to know. Some of them will tell you, well, it was Henry Kissinger. Some of them might even tell you it was Donald Duck. They don't have a clue. You can question them till hell freezes over, and you'll get a million different answers, and none of them right. And there's only one thing you can conclude about our generation. We are the dumbest most rebellious, most dis, uh, deceived, the most materialistic, the most pretender of all the Christians of history. And we're ignorant of the most simple truths of Christianity. Oh, sure, we say Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. We turn right around on the other side of the mouth and say that the 70th week of Daniel is yet future. You can't have it both ways. And each and every one of us, no matter how holy we think we are, we see our nation crumbling around us. We see a government completely out of control that lies to its people that are so morally corrupt and in, ir, irre, irredeemably wicked. And we say to ourselves, this can't happen in a Christian nation. This just can't happen in a Christian nation. Until somebody comes along and tells you, that every one of those wicked sons of hell in Washington, D.C. bows and kisses the ring and the toe of the man of sin in Rome. They take their orders from Rome, not from the people. They do, God, they do Satan's business by obeying the Pope. They're just like mi medieval kings, princes, and potentates who didn't do a thing unless they were instructed by the Pope what to do. And guess what they have planned for you, a believer in Christ, and especially those of you who know who the Antichrist is? They have death and destruction prepared for you. Tribulation like was never experienced in the history of the world. And it's the same bloodthirsty religion, the same bloodthirsty Antichrist that has always persecuted the saints of the Most High and spilled the blood of the saints and the martyrs of Jesus and is drunk with the blood of the saints and the martyrs of Jesus. It is the papacy. And guess who will come riding into Jerusalem on the colt, the foal of an ass, when this Antichrist person who signs a covenant with the Jews for seven years, in the midst of it, breaks that covenant and causes the Jewish sacrifices and oblations to cease, and is finally taken out of the way? Why, the Pope of Rome, of course. Will you worship him and obey him then? 
because that's what your Protestant and evangelical pastor is preparing you to do. That's why they're ecumenical. That's why they're making ecumenical inroads with the man of sin in Rome in the name of peace and unity. And they're taking you with them. You who are ignorant of the truth as I was for 50 years of my life. Listen again. I'm no different than you. For 50 years of my life, I believed in the future fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel. Never was taught of the historical fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel. Now I know the truth. And I want you to know the truth. I don't want you to be deceived one more minute not one more hour, not one more day, not one more year. I want you to know the truth today. Historicism is the correct interpretation of Bible prophecy. Prophecy is simply history foretold. If you want to know what the true prophecy is, the true interpretation you have to consult history. And history leaves no room for doubt who the Antichrist is. And it equally, according to the New Testament, leaves no room for doubt that the 70th week of Daniel was fulfilled 2,000 years ago by Messiah the Prince, not the Antichrist that you've been taught about, the real Christ, the Son of the living God, the Redeemer of the world, the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world, he fulfilled every jot and every tittle of the 70th week of Daniel as recorded perfectly and completely in the New Testament, the best historical record you'll ever find anywhere in the world. History validates the prophecy of Daniel. And that history is found only in the New Testament. And it's a slam dunk, folks. Now, if anybody tries to tell you that the 70th week of Daniel's yet future or any portion of that prophecy is yet future, he is a liar and a deceiver, and he will have you burning in hell if you follow his teaching. Do you still love your Protestant evangelical pastor? He will have you worshiping the Pope of Rome if God allows that phony futurist fulfillment to continue. But if you don't, if you if if you have any doubts at all about what I've been telling you, ask yourself this question. What was the mantra in 1948 when the modern nation state of Israel was established in a day? It's a miracle of God. God is restoring the Jews to their ancient homeland. The Jews are going to be saved, and we Christians ought to get in behind them, right? They said, and 40 years down the road, Jesus Christ is going to return. Or maybe seven years down the road, Jesus is going to return. Yeah, that's the ticket. Seven years down the road, Jesus Christ is going to return. Isn't that what they said? It absolutely is what they said. 1955 came and went. 1967 came and went. The year 2000 came and went. Here we are, 2021, and there's still no temple on Temple Mount Jerusalem. There's still no seven-year covenant. There's no breaking of the covenant in the, after three and a half years. There's still a Muslim temple on the top of Temple Mount. No matter how much you want to believe the futurist interpretation, you've got to ask yourself the honest question. What's taking God so long? Is he having trouble with this? 
I mean, if God created the world in six days, why is he having such a tough time taking that temple off Temple Mount so we can build a temple? All of a sudden, the God of creation must be too weak and feeble and old to knock down that temple. Maybe we need to help him with some missiles or something. Every time there's talk about knocking down that temple and building a, a tribulation temple for the Jews, somebody starts launching rockets into Jerusalem. The Palestinians. The uh, uh, those from Damascus and Libya and Syria. And now uh, uh, Iran. This is just too complicated for the God of glory. He's having difficulty with his homework. you got to believe. You have been made a fool by the Antichrist of Rome. Because futurism is his creation. You see, all throughout the history of the Roman Catholic Church, there have always been those monks and nuns who finally got a copy of the Bible so that they could read it for themselves instead of being spoon-fed by a priest. And they read enough of it to realize, hey, the man of sin, the son of perdition, the little horn of Daniel, the beast, it's our Pope. And they started preaching this stuff right in the Roman Catholic Church. And so the papacy said, we've just got to stop this rebellion, telling everybody that the Pope's the Antichrist. We know the Protestants can't be shut up, but we can't have this kind of rebellion in the Roman Catholic Church. So we've got to have some monks and nuns and stuff studying the scripture to come up with an alternative interpretation of the prophecies and pin the onus of Antichrist onto somebody else. I don't care if it's somebody in the history. I don't care if it's somebody in the future. You've just got to paint somebody else as the Antichrist so that the papacy can rule and reign over the kings of the earth, be the king of the kings and the lord of the lords until Christ returns. Because that's what Scripture says. It will be Christ who will destroy the man of sin with the spirit of his mouth and the brightness of his coming. So they came up with two alternative interpretations of Bible prophecy. Preterism, which says Nero was the Antichrist, and that means the papacy is restoring the kingdom of Christ that was destroyed by Nero. And then we have the futurists who have won the day which says, no, the Antichrist is a single individual that comes just before Christ returns. He's going to sign a seven-year peace treaty with the Jews. And that's the one everybody believes. So Rome had to get busy and find a way to restore the nation state of Israel, to restore Jews living in the land so that they could build a temple and begin animal sacrifices again. Otherwise, they can't fulfill this phony, futurist interpretation of Daniel's prophecy. Never mind that Jesus fulfilled it perfectly and completely 2,000 years ago, as recorded perfectly and completely in the New Testament. we got to make all these wide-eyed, bushy-tailed Protestants think there's some future Antichrist coming, so they quit blaming the man of sin in Rome. And Roman Catholics can put down their own internal rebellion by retrieving all the Bibles and making sure nobody can read the Bible anymore in the Roman Catholic Church. Do you realize, people, and I'm just describing to you documented, irrefutable history? That's exactly what the papacy has done. But you wouldn't believe it because you believe the Antichrist is future. No matter how much sense I make, no matter how much historical documentation I can present, there's a certain percentage and a vast majority of professing Christendom that will not believe the truth because futurism just tastes better. 
if we believe in a future Antichrist, we can eat, drink, and be merry because we don't have to worry about the Antichrist, see? But if you're, you're a historicist, you're a true Bible-believing Christian, you realize that all throughout the Christian era, the Pope has run roughshod over God's heritage, been the most brutal taskmaster that there ever was, that put Nero, Caligula, and all the, the, the pagan Roman persecutors to shame. No one has spilt more Protestant blood than the papacy, the man of sin in Rome. And knowing this means we have to pick up the protest against the Antichrist. You've got a choice to make. You're going to deceive yourself to believe that the Antichrist is future, or are you going to pick up your cross and follow Christ and protest the Antichrist of Scripture, history, and prophecy? and suffer the consequences. The choice is yours. Choose well. Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, thank you very much, Tom. I agree with everything that you said, and I have to say at the end of this broadcast, it was a wonderful introduction to the 18th reading, but we're almost at an hour, so we're going to leave it with this introduction. We're going to leave it with this warning. We're going to leave it with this call for you to study the Bible. We're going to leave it with this call for you to study real history, measure the history that is taught in the world against the prophecies of the Bible, and if they don't match, it's a lie, and if they match, it is true. And we gave you example over example over example for the last almost 50 minutes, almost an hour, how to do that and to do your own studies. Because Tom and I can talk here as long as the cows come home, if you do not believe it for yourself and can prove it with the proof that you can find for yourself and that you can find in the uncorrupted AV 611 King James Bible, then we can really talk until the cows come home. It doesn't matter. You will never believe it. You have to study it for yourself. You have to take what Tom says and what I say on this broadcast as a study help for yourself. Tom cannot convince you of the truth. I cannot convince you of the truth. Only the Holy Spirit can convince you of the truth. And the Holy Spirit does convince you of the truth when he leads you into the study of the Word of God, which is the Bible. It's easy as that. But there is no other way. And when you will be led by the Holy Spirit into the true study of the Bible, into the true Word of God, you will see that Prophecy has been fulfilled all throughout the last five or th six thousand years of history. You can read the Old Testament and see the fulfillment of their prophecies. You can read the New Testament and read the fulfillment of their prophecies. Speaking of Paul, 2 Thessalonians 2, for example, and of course speaking for the very great part of the book of Revelation, which is a prediction of Jesus Christ for the church age. He warned the church of the time that would come to them while he is gone and the Antichrist would reign here on the world. In John it is said when the Antichrist would come, when he would reign, how long he would reign and would happen. So measure everything that you have here in this world historically as uh, history books. Yeah? Measure that on the prophecies of the Bible and when they match, believe it. But find that out for yourself. Do not believe me. Do not believe Tom. Tom said he has been betrayed for 50 years of his life. I have been betrayed almost as long because I didn't believe in God. That means we are fallible. But we, in comparison to your protestant lying preacher in your church, we admit that we have been wrong. And now... We not only tell you the truth, but we also tell you where to find it and search it for yourself, that with the satisfaction of doing your own research, you can say, I believe this because I looked it up for myself, now I understand it, and now all of a sudden, all the world makes sense. 
everything happening in this world makes sense when I see that the Antichrist is historical, has been put into power in 538 with temporal power, in 606 with spiritual power, that little horn became the great horn, the little horn became the papacy, the king, um, the uh, the papacy that every king of the world, like the American presidents and the German Bundeskanzler and uh, the English prime minister and all, go to and kiss his ring and kiss his feet. And now you don't have questions anymore. Now you know, because you do your own research. These are the words that I want to end this broadcast with. And I know um, I, I want to give Tom the mic for another few minutes, because I think that he will uh, probably... Uh, tell you the same in his own words. It is your own research that you have to believe, and your own research is only valid if it is based on the true Word of God, the AV 1611 King James Bible. Therefore, read and study your Bible and measure everything in the Bible against what is thrown at you in this world. Be like a good Berean, Acts chapter 17, verse 11, where it says that the Jews in uh, Berea were different than the others because they studied the Bible every day to see if the things were so. What do you think that means, if these things were so? They measured everything in the world against the word of God. And if it held up, they kept it. And if not, they threw it away. And that's what you should do. Throw the false teaching away, getting to know the truth by your own study. Please, Tom, do you have a last few words? Then I want to give you the mic for the end of this broadcast. No, I'm, I'm pretty well spent. Good. I think I have said everything that the Lord laid on my heart. Many of you found it repetitious. Maybe, a, maybe some of them have found it even monotonously repetitious. But look, you've been lied to. If you're anything like me, you've been rehearsing the lie for 50 years of your life. You've been taught futurism by your pastor. You've been taught futurism by your quote-unquote Sunday school teacher. You've been taught futurism by your aunts and your uncles and your mom and your dad and everyone who's important in your life. And how do I know that's true? Because everybody teaches futurism. There's hardly anybody in the world that teaches historicism anymore. Historicism has not been preached in this country since about 1900 AD. Between 1810 and 1900 AD, there were a rash of Protestant pastors who fought this futurist lie tooth and nail, morning, noon, and night. To reverse the direction this country was going. To restore the historical interpretation of Bible prophecy. But the people of God wouldn't have it. They'd rather believe in carefully devised fables. And they heard their futurist mantra over and over and over and over again. From cradle to grave. There have been people of our generation that have never even heard the word historicism uttered. And yet, prior to the 1800s, historicism was the only interpretation there was. No one had ever heard of futurism. No one had ever heard of preterism. Until the popes began to through their Jesuits who infiltrated the Protestant seminaries in England and the United States began to preach both preterism and futurism to shed the onus of Antichrist away from the historical Antichrist, the true biblical, historical, and prophetic Antichrist in Rome to shift the onus of Antichrist on to anybody, whether of ancient history, ancient Roman history, or forward in time, all the way until Christ returns. 
And they don't care which lie you believe, preterism or futurism, as long as you believe one of them, as long as you abandon your historical belief in historicism. And there's hardly a historicist left in this country. As a percentage of professing Christians, there are almost no historicists left. So you tell me, what's the state of Christendom today? Is it all good news, like your pastor would have you believe? Or is it devastatingly horrifying? We've got to pray. We've got to repent of our futurist delusions. We've got to restore true Bible Protestantism in our churches, in our homes, and in our schools. We need to put our government on notice that if the government serves the papacy and obeys him rather than Christ, then nothing but judgment is in store for this country. That's the truth. You know, in this country, let me just fast forward to the end of time and tell you what the scripture tells us. It says, after those four beasts, after those four world Gentile powers have come to their end, there's going to be a stone that was cut out of the mountain without hands, was we'll strike the image in the feet and grind it to powder and they'll all blow away with the wind. Don't make a mistake. What that represents is every Gentile power from the Babylonian, through the Medo-Persian, through the Grecian, and through the Roman, and through the Papal Roman. It's all going to be ground to powder, and it's going to blow away with the wind. And that stone is Christ, and it will become a great mountain and fill the whole earth. God lets you know ahead of time, history foretold the destruction of all Gentile governments for all time because they were wicked and unrighteous. Never did a Gentile power bring Christ's righteousness to the world. They all served the papacy. And they're all going to be destroyed. Because that's what's going to happen to the wicked. They're all going to be destroyed. Not one will escape. And once the wicked are all dead, then the righteous, as few as they may be, will tread upon their ashes. in a heavenly kingdom that will never end, whose king is righteous. God hasten the day. I'll see you next time.
Oh,